My name is Margaret Post, and I'm delighted to introduce to you Mark Warren, Associate Professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Professor Warren is a sociologist concerned with the revitalization of American democratic and community life. He studies efforts to strengthen institutions that anchor inner city communities and to build broad-based alliances among these institutions and across race and social class. His 2001 book, Dry Bones Rattling, Community Building to Revitalize American Democracy, has received wide acceptance among scholars and practitioners alike for its accessible and in-depth analysis of efforts by the Industrial Areas Foundation to rebuild social capital by promoting inclusive and multiracial political action as a vehicle for revitalizing democracy. And as a side note, I use that book in my organizing class every semester. I'm a huge fan of the analysis that Mark provides in it. Professor Warren's most recent book is Fire in the Heart, White Activists Embrace Racial Justice. It is the first in-depth study of its kind that examines the processes through which white Americans become activists for racial justice. In his forthcoming book, very prolific, A Match on Dry Grass, Community Organizing as a Catalyst for School Reform, Warren argues that community organizing can be a viable antidote to the failures of public education. Prior to joining the faculty at Harvard in 2002, Professor Warren was assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Fordham University, where he was also the founding director of the Office of Service Learning. A person deeply committed to bridging theory with practice, Professor Warren's teaching and scholarship have made a remarkable contribution to the practice and pedagogy of community organizing. And I am delighted to introduce him to you now. Thank you very much to Margaret and the other folks here to invite me to speak with you tonight about community organizing, subject obviously very much the center of my life personally in my professional work, and it's, it's nice to be back at a Jesuit university and to hear all these connections that have happened with the Fordham University where I used to teach that the mayor of your fine city is a graduate and, and many other folks, so that, that's great. I want to talk tonight about some of my thoughts about community organizing and the challenges that it faces in the 21st century as well as I think the profound contributions it can make to solving some of our, our problems. I'm going to talk more broadly about it, but also focus a little bit on the research that I've done on community organizing efforts at education reform, and also about my the recent book, Fire in the Park, which actually is, is here also, that tries to examine how it is that we can build a broader base of support among the white community for racial and social justice issues, which is obviously at the center of organizing. That book, Fire in the Heart, I actually finished writing it two days before the inauguration of Barack Obama and uh, immediately went home, gathered up my family, and hopped in the car to drive down to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. And how, how many people were there? Were there many people there? All right, so a, a fair number of people. And you might remember it was an, an extremely cold uh, day, and we were staying at a friend's and got up in the dark at 5 o'clock in the morning in the freezing cold, and you know, my, the kids were complaining, and anyway, we got on the city bus and we started going down to the inauguration and at first it was empty and more and more people started getting on and it was all kinds of different people. We got to the mall and they had greeters there waiting for us. I don't know if people remember that. There were, there were greeters welcoming you and it was just all of a sudden the sun started to come up and it was this huge multiracial crowd and it was this incredible spirit I think there of people coming together to support really a different kind of vision a uh, different kind of society that we could have in the United States. And I think it was a great day of, of hope for this country. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in hope, and I, and I think we have to hold on to that. I, I'm amazed at how quickly that seems to have gone. You know, where are we at two years later? How could we have gone from that scene on the mall and that kind of vision and hope to the situation we're in today? I don't want to provide a complete and thorough analysis of that, but I think that part of the problem is that we did not really have the foundations of uh, relationships, uh, really an organized base to really push through an agenda that represented the vision that the people on the mall had that, that day. And I think Barack Obama did authentically voice during his campaign. And the, the conservative forces, the more right-wing forces have been much better organized than, than other folks have been. 
we really do lack, in the sense of a real political constituency for social justice, for racial justice in this country. And you know, the question that I would ask is, well, obviously there's a lots of people who would support that kind of vision. Um, in fact, you know, 10 years ago, if you had suggested that even a majority of, of Americans and, and a near majority of white Americans would vote for an African American for president, people would have thought you were completely crazy, actually. I mean, yet it happened. And so there's certainly an incredible potential here. So the question I ask is, well, what would it take to kind of create a basis for this kind of change? And I want to talk about three things and talk about community organizing and about that. And these things are relationships, power, and vision. We certainly heard in the introductory remarks at dinner that organizing is about building power. It certainly is. But I would like to, I think, in, in, in this talk, place relationships more at the center of this whole kind of, of question. And I think that at its core, community organizing is about building relationships and power behind a vision. And I'm going to talk about this work that community organizing could do along these lines. First, by thinking some examples of organizing around education reform. And then I want to talk a little bit about coalition building across lines of race. And then I want to end with some thoughts about the relationship between local organizing and national organizing, kind of bringing us back to the national agenda that we also face. So if that sounds OK, that's what we're about to do. OK. I would like to argue, uh, or like to claim, really, that I think the state of our public education system is the most pressing social justice issue we face in this country today. And 20 years ago, I don't know that we would have <coughs> seen it quite that way. And in fact, I think it's interesting that 20 years ago, you would have been hard pressed to find a single community organizing in this group in this country addressing public education reform. It wasn't there. Organizing groups were working on housing or working on economic development, some of the issues that your mayor was working on in, in the South Bronx, as he pointed out, but not so much around education. Well, now, by my recent estimate, there are about 500 community organizing groups across the country who are actively engaged in trying to improve the quality of schooling in low-income communities and address equity in public education. This, I think, is in recognition of the fact that quality of education is absolutely central to the life prospects of children growing up in low-income families and communities in a way that wasn't so much true 30, uh, 20, 30, or 40 years ago. But I think that to address education has been a profound challenge to the world of community organizing. And this gets into this relationship and power question. I think if you want to stereotype organizing a little bit 30 years ago, you could have said it was about mobilizing residents to demand change on public institutions and to hold those institutions accountable. So you can, map, you can build power, you can amass people, you can demand that housing authorities improve housing codes or city services be improved or housing being built. Well, it turns out this doesn't really work in the world of education. You can't simply demand that institutions of public education improve and expect them to approve. You can't, in that sense, bang on the doors of the schoolhouse from the outside and really expect change. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, our institutions of public education don't have the internal capacity necessarily to change. They don't have the resources, financial resources, oftentimes the human resources or the, or the social resources to do it. But the second reason is, um, and I think this is fairly different from a lot of the other campaigns that organizing put through, uh, and I like to put it this way, you can't force someone to teach well. You can't do it. All right? So you can't just demand that the teaching force teach better. Sometimes they don't even know how to teach better. But it's more of a human endeavor. There has to be a transformation of the self in relationship to organizing. There has to be a, a learning, uh, in a sense, some people call this an adaptive change. It's a more profound transformation. And it has to do with educators understanding the communities that they're trying to serve, developing a different relationship to them that is one more about mutuality and reciprocity, and coming in a sense to care about the children and the families of which they're serving in a different kind of way, thinking about them as their, their own children. Too often we have teachers coming in from outside the communities who are unfamiliar with families and the community life, have sometimes deficit views of those children, and are not really in a position of teaching them very well. And you can't simply force a change in that. So let me tell you about some of the efforts of a group called PAC, People Acting in Community Together in San Jose, California, as an example of what some organizing groups have been trying to do. And this comes from some research that's been done by a large team of researchers at Harvard that's coming out in the book that was mentioned earlier. So let me take you to a school district called Alum Rock School District. It's in San Jose, California. It's in the center of Silicon Valley, okay, the center of innovation, high technology in our country, one of the wealthiest areas in general. 
But Alum Rock District is in East San Jose. It's a neighborhood known, known as uh, Sal Si Puede, which is roughly translated as get out if you can. It's actually the neighborhood that Cesar Chavez got started in, organizing in, but it's very poor. And in some ways, even though San Jose is the third largest city in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's a very poor, forgotten sort of backwater area, almost, you could say. And the schools there are not working very well. They're large, impersonal institutions, disconnected from the community, teaching children in, of immigrants in highly individualized, competitive manner, which conflicts oftentimes with the values of their home, community, and faith. Only half of the children in that district graduate from high school. Half of the ones who graduate go to college, and about half of them who go to college actually graduate from college. So in this day and age, when it takes a college degree, for the most part, to support a family and anything close to a middle class uh, style of life, only about 12% of children growing up in East San Jose are destined to actually graduate from college. So if this is not a tremendously profound social justice issue, I don't, I don't know what is. The organization called PACT emerged out of the Solinsky organizing tradition. It's part of the PICO National Network, which is a, a large, originally California-based, but now national-based, faith-based community organizing network. It's rooted in faith traditions, particularly those of Catholic social thought, well represented here at the institution. And it consists of 25 congregations, mostly Latino and mostly Catholic, serving mainly families, immigrant families. And PAC builds uh, what they call local organizing committees around congregations, where they bring people together to start to build relationships, to have conversations, to draw upon Catholic social thought, to frame the missions of mission for Catholics to engage in public life, to strengthen and promote their values and the, and the conditions that their families face. There's an intense focus on leadership development, a lot of training, mentoring that goes on in their organizing. Carmen Rodriguez is one of those leaders. She was an immigrant mother from Mexico with three children in the Alum Rock School District. She was approached through her local congregation was brought together with others to start to talk about their concerns about education for their children and their dreams for them. She ended up going to the leadership training opportunities offered by PACT and the PICO Network. The lead organizer there, Matt Hammer, was involved in mentoring her. She started out inviting five other parents to a house meeting at her house. Then 10 other parents started to come, then 20 and 50, as they began to talk about what was, might be possible to have in their schools. And she said this, through this process, we parents discovered that we had much more right than they who were the directors and the teachers, and that gave us a lot of strength and a lot of power. We understood that if we joined together, and if more people joined together, we were stronger. In addition, it was learning to speak out, speak to the people who are there, how to speak out to them, not to fight with them, but rather to speak out using the right words and demanding what we really had to demand, what we deserved, what our children deserved, and what they weren't giving us. They started to have conversations about the quality of education that the children were receiving and tried to start having a conversation about, well, if you were dissatisfied with this kind of education, what would be your vision for a great education for their children? And it's interesting that the organizers found that although the parents had lots of concerns about what was happening with their children, that originally they thought about it as their own problems. If their child wasn't <coughs> succeeding well in school, that it was the fault of the child not working hard enough or maybe it was their fault because they didn't speak English and couldn't help their child enough. And by bringing people together, they started to understand that their own private situation was really a reflection of a much broader public situation in the Allen Rock School District. They got to that point, but the organizer, Matt Hammer, says they had a harder time getting people to really envision, well, what would a great education look like? These are folks who themselves had not, either had not gone to school in the United States or had not had a particularly successful education themselves. So they started to take people to visit successful schools that were serving Latino immigrant children around, first in Oakland, and then in New York City and other parts of the country. And Matt says this about it. So we started helping people begin to develop a priority list of issues that they wanted to work on. And it really took off like wildfire. It was very much like throwing a match on dry grass, the title of our book. I don't know that anybody had ever been in that neighborhood asking these kinds of basic questions about what are your dreams for your kids and what's going on at the local public school? And what do you think about building an organization that would have the power to deal with some of these same problems? Well, I said they went to Oakland and they visited schools that had been started by the PICO organizing group there called Oakland Communities Organization. And they developed a campaign to open small schools. So they envisioned that part of the problem was that these were very large and personal institutions, maybe with a thousand 
sometimes even up to 1,500 children at an elementary school. And there was a dis very powerful disconnection between the schools that were very big and, and uh, impersonal, staffed by teachers who came from outside the neighborhood. And they started to envision opening small schools that would be more community-based, more family-oriented, where people that would have a teaching force that really cared about their children. And they mounted a campaign to try to get the school district to open three new small autonomous schools. But it turned out that the district leaders had other plans. In their view, the best way to go was to actually centralize the school district and to start to implement direct instruction. So the idea was that they would have all the teachers in the entire school district doing exactly what the central administration said at any one particular time, and it would be a highly structured curriculum going through Monday through Friday with tests on Friday. And they used the open court reading system and the Saxon mathematics system and, and others. So here's where, uh, in some sense, the building of power did come in. The PACT organization had to mobilize hundreds of people on a regular basis to come to the school board meetings to demand a change and, and have one-on-one -on -one meetings with school board members and district leaders. And they finally got the school board to, to agree to open three schools. They actually had demand six originally, and they got them to open three. So in that sense, they won. But then they realized that if they were really going to implement this plan, if the schools are really, that were going to be opened were going to be something different, they had to start to build the different kinds of relationships between parents and teachers. So they formed design teams that would be composed of parents, the new principals of the schools, and the teachers who were planning to start working at them. And these teams, including parents, teachers, and principals, designed the schools from the ground up. And it was really in this kind of a collaboration process that change started to happen. And here's a quote from Kristen Henney, who became the principal of the first school called Lucha. I have those parents who were on the design team who I have probably the deepest relationship with because we went through so much blood and sweat and tears. So for those parents, it's a friendship. We've crossed that line between I'm their school principal to I'm their friend to we've worked together on a professional level about something that we all care about. When they opened Lucha, they opened it on organizing principles. The teachers were all meant to work in teams. They did home visits. They were meant to learn about the culture of the community. Parents were meant to be engaged at all levels of the school. And in fact, parents fill the halls of the schools every day. The principal sees herself as not just a manager of a school staff, but as a leader of a whole school community. And in that sense, a more relational culture was deeply embedded in the school. If I had the opportunity to visit the Lucha School, and I wanted to share a couple of stories with you about the new kind of culture that can be created there. Well, I was invited to come in an evening, and they were having a, a meeting to apply to the state to write an application to the state to, have, to enter the school in a competition for an award, a state award for a school. So I got to the meeting, and there were 100 parents there at the meeting. And the principal came rushing up to me and started apologizing profusely that so few parents had showed up. Now, this, this, is, a, this is a meeting to write an application. Right? And 100 parents were there. And she's apologizing that it was a low turnout. There was some big thing happening at the church down the road that night. So she apologized. So I'm at the meeting. And the first person that stands up, Latino gentleman, says, well, I, I think before we, we start this meeting, we should get our, our, our values out on the table. And he said, first thing we should say is that parents are the first teachers of their children. We're not here to support teachers. The teachers are here to support us. And the teachers are working for us in this school. And then the principal reads out this part of the award application. She says, this is in the application. A plethora of events take place throughout the year to encourage the parents are involved and informed and able to positively contribute to not only their child's progress, but the greater development of the entire community. That sounds pretty good, right? There was a huge uproar amongst the parents of that statement. And their response was this. You make it sound like the school's involving us. We're the group that created the school in the first place. We involve each other in the school. And they had to take that out of the award application and rewrite it entirely along these new lines. At Lucha, the, the attitude of the teachers is that their, their job is to promote academic achievement, but also to promote leadership, community leadership amongst the children. So I was invited to, the, every morning they start with a, what they call a Lucha launch. And it happened, this is an elementary school, and it happens in the courtyard around the school. And of course, they don't have to worry about winter, so they can do this at any time of the year. Uh, so I showed up the next morning to, to visit the Lucha Launch. They're very excited that I should come and see that. So here, this is just a, some description notes that were taken by one of the doctoral students who was with me at the time. It says, the principal blows a whistle, and the children organize themselves into lines of about 20. 
Good morning, Lucha leaders. Kristen, the principal's voice, booms to the crowd. After the Pledge of Allegiance, the principal leads the Lucha Creed. Students and teachers and students and many parents loudly and enthusiastically declare together, I am a leader in my home, in my school, and pointing at the neighborhood all around them in a large circle in my community. Together, they recite a promise to each other to be responsible, respectful, compassionate, and pounding their small fists into their hands enthusiastically to work hard every day. So I'd like to suggest to you that this is the kind of uh, school culture, the kinds of transformation that can occur in our public education system if we take a community organizing approach, partly to build the power to make this thing happen, but also to build new kinds of relationships among parents and between parents and educators who are often divided by race and social class and, and profession. Lucha and the two other small schools are some of the most successful in the district. Actually, Lucha is the most successful school in, in state standardized test scores in the district. And I think it's a very interesting interconnected nature going on here. I think the school works because it's connected to the community whose engagement through faith communities formed and sustains the school in the first place and teaches young people to be citizen leaders and continues to serve as a site for building citizenship amongst parents and members of the faith communities. So it's a kind of, psych I think, a cyclical process in which organized parents and communities help shape a school that then serves as a, an institutional site, if you will, for further kinds of community building. Let me shift focus a little bit. If I've talked a little bit now from the point of view of the community, a low-income Latino community, organizing itself and reaching out to others, I want to shift the focus a little bit now and look at what it might take to have members of dominant society, if you will, reach out in the other kind of direction. And that's been a big focus of my work. I do believe, in a broad sense, that what will it take to create serious uh, social change in this country is both organizing communities of color and low-income communities for the power to push for change, but I also think we need a strategy for winning over the hearts and minds the majority of the population to embrace that kind of change. That if we cannot come together in some kind of a larger way, symbolized by the Obama rally at the beginning or the inauguration rally, then I, I don't think that we're going to be able to create the change that we, we need to make. And so I decided to study that process by interviewing 50 white Americans who had become committed to the cause of racial justice and had become activists in various fields. Many of them were community organizers. Some of them were leaders of faith communities involved in multiracial community organizing efforts. Some of them were educators and teachers, and some of them were, were policy advocates. And I wanted to understand how could it be that people who are not themselves victims of racial discrimination, and people whose closest family and friends are not victims of racial discrimination, how can they come to understand and become aware and understand that experience, and even more so care enough about it to take a stand for racial justice? And I think that's a profound question. And I thought that I could find some answers to that by interviewing people who had gone through that kind of a process. And I'm not going to talk about everything that I found, but I do think that one of the fundamental findings of the research was that cognitive and rational understandings or cognitive and rational appeals to white people had little effect on actually producing commitment and action. And by that I mean we place a lot of faith in education in this country. If we could just educate white people about racism, then they would come to oppose it. I am a college and university professor, and I think we certainly should educate young people about it. But I have to say that in the interviews with 50 people, I found hardly any evidence that those, that kind of an educational process actually moved anybody to take the commitment and action. Or I think we, we oftentimes focus a lot on, on rational kinds of strategies. It costs more to incarcerate a child than to educate a child. We know that, right? Well, I found really no evidence that that actually changes many white people's opinion about what to do in the situation. It's true statement, and I think it's an important argument to make, but it doesn't necessarily move people to commitment and action. And instead, what I, fo I found a number of things, but I found that relationships really lay at the heart of uh, relationships and, and values and vision, I suppose I would say, really lay at the heart of what really transformed the people in the study that I conducted. Relationships are a way to understand the experience of other people, and even more than understanding it, coming to care about it because it affects real people that you know and care about. And let me tell you, I'm going to shift a little bit and tell you a few of the, the stories that I heard 
from the people that I interviewed to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. First person I want to talk about is Penda Hare. She's now the co-director of the Advancement Project, which is an organization in Washington that tries to bring organizations and communities of color together with legal advocates and others to create change in education and criminal justice system. And I want to start a little bit with the values piece because I did find this broadly across the people that I interviewed. She grew up in an all-white neighborhood in Knoxville, Tennessee during the 1960s. In high school, she had a, a powerful experience that occurred this way. She and her family attended a Southern Baptist congregation. She took the values of her faith tradition very seriously, and she joined a youth choir that sought to recruit new kids to their Sunday school. Well, it turned out, though, that the congregation had an official whites-only policy. And this is what she said. A group of high schoolers in the church, led by a youth leader that the church had hired, formed a choir. We sang at other churches, traveling on a bus that we raised the money to buy. We decided we would use the bus to go out on Sunday mornings and bring children or adults to our church. We were going to be little evangelists. Well, we got a great response. We had all of these kids on our bus coming to Sunday school, and the majority were black. I don't know how long it went on before somebody invoked the whites-only policy that had been on the books for years. There was a vote, and this time it was much debated, because our entire youth group was in favor of ending this policy and couldn't believe that they were going to cut off our bus. You know, we were doing what the church had taught us to do. So the church voted again, and they voted to exclude African Americans again. And that had a huge impact on me. I would say that was probably defining. I'm starting to cry now thinking about it, and in fact I had to shut off the tape recorder because she was in tears recalling the incident. She says, I'm starting to cry now thinking about it because we had to go let, tell those kids that, that we couldn't come and take them to church anymore. And I definitely remember thinking that this is unfair, certainly not letting these kids into the church is unfair and wrong, and that it was clear to me that black people were treated worse than white people and that that was wrong. Well, I think there's a lot in that story, but there's two things I want to point out. I think that there's a reservoir of values that we have in our faith communities as well as in our society, and that many white people grow up really believing very deeply in them. And they don't actually see that racism in our society and injustice in our society is actually undermining and contradicting those values. And when they start to build some kind of a relationship or have some kind of a direct experience, as Penda did on this bus, the violation of these values become very clear to them. And it serves, I think, as a very important first step in motivation towards taking some kind of action. Well, Penda went on to college, eventually Harvard Law School, and she joined the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which is a sort of nation's premier civil rights legal organization. And she traveled across the South fighting discrimination cases and voting rights cases. And she built relationships with black clients and with their black <coughs> colleagues at the, at the Legal Defense Fund. And through these relationships, Penda, like the other people that I interviewed, started learning more about the realities of racism. And this is one of the stories she tells. My first case was a claim of promotion discrimination by the Postal Service in Jacksonville, Florida. My first client that I put on the witness stand was a person named James Douglas, who had applied for something like 25 or 30 promotions at the post office. He was a mail carrier, African American. I went to his house, met his family, and talked to him about all these jobs. He had been in the Army in World War II. He'd gotten a college degree and a master's degree, and the only job he could get was working as a mail carrier. Well, it occurred to me that my father did not have a college degree or a master's degree, was roughly the same age as Mr. Douglas, had come out of the Army and had gotten this nice job at Union Carbide. He worked his way up through the ranks. We always thought we were deserving because my father worked hard. He got up at 5.30 in the morning to make sure he was there on time, and that was a hard life for us, we thought. But when I saw Mr. Douglas's light, it was like, oh, I'm privileged. For the first time, I understood in a different way that I was racially privileged. Because of my father's ability to get that job at Union Carbide, I got put in the best high school in the city where we lived and got the education that allowed me to go to Harvard. And I could see that Mr. Mr. Douglas's kids didn't have as many of those opportunities. I saw the intergenerational effect in a personal way. I also saw it in a structural way in all of the promotions that he had been denied and the way that other people in the class action case were being kept back, but I saw it in a deeply personal way. This is us giving you some sense of, I think, understanding that can grow through personal relationships that happen in people's work or in, uh, often in community organizing efforts. But I also found that people not just learned more about the experiences of racism, they also learned to care more personally about it because it affected real people that they now cared about. 
I'll tell you one, one last story about Penda. She eventually became the head of the Legal Defense Fund's office in Washington and was there when President Clinton nominated Lonnie Guineer to be the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Does, do people remember what happened in that case? Anyone? A few people. All right, we're going back a little while, I guess. Lonnie Guineer was a leading African-American legal scholar. She and Penda were friends. They had become friends through working together in the Legal Defense Fund. President Clinton nominated her to be the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, and the right wing attacked her as a, as a quota queen as, and as anti-white. And President Clinton kind of dumped her unceremoniously very quickly in what was widely seen, at least in the black community, as a, as a, as a real insult. Well, Penda tells this story about it. She was in Washington then. Lonnie Guineer was attacked because of her vote views on voting rights. And so it was personal in the sense that, well, I'm a voting rights lawyer. I have the same views as Lonnie. If she can be attacked and humiliated publicly, then that's essentially saying the same thing about me. And then it was personal in the sense that Lonnie was staying at my house part of the time when she would come down to do her Washington round of meetings. And I remember I had just had, had, just had, had a baby. And at the time, when the newspapers were writing all these things about how anti-white she was, I remember her sitting in my house in the rocking chair holding my white, blonde-headed baby. And it was just surreal. How can this happen? How can they paint a picture of her that is so beyond reality, and yet they get away with it? Well, if people start off, in a sense, with their commitment to racial justice through these direct experiences, through starting to have relationships with people of color, these relationships also help people understand the experience of other people across the uh, color line in a deeper way and come to care about it. I also found that something else occurred through these kinds of relationships, relationships that were really built in and around people taking action together. What I found is that in these kinds of community organizing groups or education activist groups, people started to build a sense, a, a sense of a vision for what they were working for in the future. And that vision uh, I came to see as one of human community, or we could even say a beloved community, which comes from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and I think this was very interesting. You know, I asked people, what, what are you really working for? And there were a lot of pieces to that, certainly a society without the kinds of deep inequalities we have in education, in economics, uh, in our criminal justice system. But what I really found is that people framed all of this in a sense that uh, what we're really are trying to create is a new kind of human community, where people care about each other, treat each other with respect, and where people's needs are taken care of in a more egalitarian way. And it was really this notion of a human community that lied at the center. And if you really, if I, when I ask people, well, what harm does racism do to white people? The answer I got to that was that it really undermines our humanity. It undermines the humanity of our entire society. And this is a quote from Madeline Talbot, who's a longtime community organizer in Chicago. And she said this, I think being white and privileged in a racist society, you feel like you're one of the family members of Noah on the Ark. You hear all of the people beating on the doors, trying to get in. And you've got to find a way to open the door. This work allows you to crack the door open, which otherwise you'd have to kill yourself. I mean, that's the way it feels to me. You feel like that kind of privilege is killing you. It's one of the things that makes white society less connected and less welcoming and less warm because it's constantly protecting itself from the people and the flood on the outside, and it's a terrible way to live. Well, I also had people talk about, well, how did they envision this new kind of, of, this kind of society? And I wanted to read a couple of quotes about that. These are both from faith leaders in community organizing efforts. The first is from uh, Reverend Z. Holler, who's involved with a group called the Beloved Community Center in Greensboro, North Carolina. And he said this, where everyone is honored and respected for who they are, where the brokenness and the sins are recognized, we help one another see our weaknesses and others help us see what we don't see. We help them see what they don't see. Together, if what we see in each other is grossly unjust, we call it by name. We try to come to grips with it. We forgive one another. We move ahead as best we can. And that means policy. That means the structures of government. It means what you do with the economy, the goals you pursue. I think that the economy is now for the few and corrupts the many for the sake of the few, and it excludes growing numbers. The second, uh, along similar lines, comes from Reverend Joseph Elwanger. He was a faith leader in a group called MICA, a community organizing group in Milwaukee. And he put it this way, it is practicing anti-racism and insisting that we work together along, across racial, ethnic, and denominational lines. That in and of itself is a living out of what King describes as the beloved community. So we're not just working for the ultimate goal of social justice, which certainly is what we're working for, 
but we're also working at building community. And in the process, we have to dismantle some of the expectations and the fears and the structure that society, that our society has built. And I just want to reflect on those quotations for a minute. The first one is the idea that I think community organizers, people that I interviewed, the activists I interviewed, care deeply about the injustices in our society, talking about policy, talking about the structures of government. They're hard-nosed political operatives. They work hard in the campaigns that they're working on. But what I found that really deepened and sustained their commitment was not really those issues per se. It was really working with other people to try to create a new kind of vision for what our society could be about. The kind of society that they actually want to live in themselves, that they would like to raise their children in. This kind of notion of a beloved community. And that it's not something that people see as a vision that is attainable at some far distant future. That actually the work of community organizing today, is particularly those that bring people together across racial lines, across faith lines, is really the work of figuring out what that society is. How do we create new kinds of relationships today where people treat each other with respect, who really care about each other? That work of creating that society today is the ultimate work of developing a, a vision for a new society. Um, I think that I've tried to give that some of the suggestions about that at a school like Lucha and the community organizing work at PAC, but I think it's also fundamentally the kinds of things I saw across the, uh, the interviews. And I think that's very important. What sustains people in the long, hard road of working for social and racial justice is not the wins that you might have along the way, because there are also plenty of setbacks. It's the value of working with other people, trying to create new kinds of relationships. That's where the excitement comes, and that's where the meaning that it brings to people in their lives. And I would like to argue that that work fundamentally has to occur at the local level. I'm in circles, and maybe they're not the circles here, but I, I often travel in circles where people want to rush to the national level and believe that we have to have you know, I did a lot of interviews for the book and some of the national interviews I did was, well, what's the answer to how we're going to solve the problem at the national level today? I actually don't think there's an answer to how to solve the problem today at the national level. I think that we have to make a lot more progress in building new kinds of models and new kinds of relationships, bringing people together at the local level. I think it's easy to critique community organizing for its focus at the local level. Yes, we do know that our problems are tied to national and international capitalism and the political agendas of forces that operate at the national and international level. I think that we do need to address these kinds of things. That's certainly one of the challenges that we face in our country today. But I don't know that we can address them without a clear foundation of face-to-face kind of -face relationship building and visioning kinds of work at the local level. I will say that many community organizing efforts are attempting to combine local and national organizing for really the first time in a long time. I'm not going to talk a lot about these efforts, but I can later in the conversation if people want to. The PICO National Network was very involved in organizing around the health care reform. People may or may not know that. This is the network that the San Jose Group PACT is part of. They brought people to Washington over a period of a number of years and were one of the key forces in what an eventual political coalition that led to the passage of the health reform. And many of their leaders were sitting in the front row when Obama signed it. There's a wide range of efforts now to bring local organizing together to try to affect national education policy. We have something called the Alliance for Educational Justice, which is a, a coalition of about 20 local youth organizing groups. There's also a group called the Communities for Excellent Public Schools that has uh, 24 member groups across the country that are also local and statewide that have been coming to Washington. We actually have a community organizer in the Department of Education. So Alberto Vertana is their director of community outreach. He was an organizer for many years in Los Angeles. He was brought to Washington to try to lead community outreach efforts, and he's been trying to use this position as a way to bring organizing groups together to Washington. There's even been an international effort to bring organizing groups together in an anti-usury campaign that the Industrial Areas Foundation Network has been involved in with their sister network in, in Britain called the, well, London Citizens in London and the Citizen Organizing Foundation more broadly. This has been a campaign, they're calling it 10% is enough, that uh, banks should be forced to limit the uh, interest that they charge on credit cards and other things to, to 10%. So we actually have some kinds of new ideas of international organizing. Many organizing groups are connecting even across international borders. The PICO Organizing Network has been very involved now in organizing in Central America. 
the Industrial Areas Foundation has, has sister networks now in, in Britain, in Germany, and in South Africa. So I think these are all, uh, I think, some things that are very promising, but I also feel like, in the end, that it has to be this kind of relationship building work that's really going to lead the way with this. And I think that I'm, I'm going to try to end now so we can have some time for conversation. I think that you know, the last time we saw the emergence of a really strong uh, national movement around racial and social justice was the civil rights movement. And I think many of us know that you know, there was really patient local community organizing work going on for many, many years that really built the foundation. That movement did not emerge out of thin air in the 50s and 60s. It really emerged out of the very patient work that people did in creating and recreating new kinds of relationships, trying to build power at the local level. And I think that community organizers today and, and others are trying to do that, uh, that work, experimenting with new models, new kinds of relationships to build the power to really implement a vision for what a just and caring society can look like today. So thank you very much. Thank you.